use to generate the city and the matrix awakens experience. Hey, Robert. The main tool we used in the creation of the city was Houdini from Side Effects. Okay. The city is live, covering 16 square kilometers, 260 kilometers of streets, 512 kilometers of furnished sidewalks, almost 7,000 unique buildings, 18,000 vehicles, and 35,000 pedestrians, each of which are aware of each other and the traffic in the city. We used Houdini and Unreal to shape and art direct the city to our needs. We use point clouds and the new rural processor pipeline to generate it on a daily or weekly basis throughout the project, quickly generating a virtual world made of 8 million nanite instances, providing insane amounts of detail from the trash on the ground to the nuts and bolts on top of buildings. The city was regenerated 53 times, allowing its procedural rules to be refined over and over again to become what you can explore today in the Matrix Awakens experience. We use the full potential of Nanite, Lumen, and Open World in Unreal 5 to offer the most detailed virtual experience we could. Let's look at the processes used to create the city for the Matrix Awakens experience. We knew that the Matrix Awakens city would have to be an open world, covering a large area and detailed down to the litter on the streets. This equates to a very dense data set that we needed to author. We established that a four to five kilometer wide city would provide the ideal playground for the experience we wanted to build. We also knew this environment would be the base data set for a lot of other departments to work with and that they would need to be provided with updated data as we modified it. This generation had to be automated as much as possible. Procedural generation was the only way to achieve this due to the relatively small team size, the sheer density and level of detail we targeted for this project. This choice also considered that we would be using Nanite technology. Nanite virtually removes all the previous polygon limits and the resolution to which we could add detail. If you consider one square meter can have up to a million triangles without performance issues, a city of 16 kilometers square would have 16 trillion triangles. This then introduces a problem of size and the quantity of assets on disk becoming the limiting factor. Bigger assets mean slower iteration and sometimes less flexibility. We couldn't just brute force our way through this. We had to find a smart way to slice up the world. At the start of the project, we considered using OpenStreetMap data. Unfortunately, the data provided is unique in size and shape for any given place. This is too much work to translate and adapt, creating too many unique assets and edge case behaviors for generation. A more modular approach was taken, allowing for the creation of our own set of building bricks with which to compose the city. The task then becomes how to slice and chunk a realistic world and replicate it as precisely as possible with these bricks while balancing memory and real-time performance constraints. This is especially complex because in the real world, you'll always find a shape that is almost impossible to reproduce with your modular bricks. This is where having full control over the geometry of the city becomes so important. We need to keep a tight control on the percentage of unique data we would allow. First, we started with a tool designed to create the base of our city, the city layout tool. This allowed a procedurally generated American city layout to be created. It required two main inputs, a basic outline curve and the paths of the major roads. With a few attributes and options to adjust the road network set up in American city can be generated. We relied on the find the shortest path Houdini node to create the major roads. <clears throat> The tool is calculating the best fitting grid pattern to match the sizes defined by the end user. And an infinite solution of differing city layouts can be procedurally created. The 
City zoning is the next step. Using this extra utility to define zones with specific attributes like commercial or residential zoning, but mainly to shape the city silhouette. The zoning becomes the vertical modeling tool of our city. We use the Houdini Engine plugin in Engine to design the city sketch directly in Unreal. This is a, a very user-friendly way to model the cityscape, creating a quick feedback loop for art and cinematic direction to achieve the desired feel. Once we have a base city layout, the tool outputs a soup of metadata that is used downstream in a procedural graph to produce the city. Metadata that includes road networks, lot definitions, and sidewalks. Here you can see the road connectivity metadata, traffic density data, <clears throat> and some pedestrian density data. With this soup of metadata ready, we feed it into the city processor and start the final creation steps. This dependency graph shows an overview of the key components of the city tools and their dependencies flowing from top to bottom. The flow is important because it shows at which step we needed to regenerate the city when a rule is changed. The dependency graph is broken into three stages the city base, the city core, and the set dressing. Here is an overview of the full graph inside Houdini. And with the dependencies visible in the graph. The first step after the city layout is to define the roads and their topology. The road network output from the city layout tool is comprised of splines with only two points. There are three layers of the road hierarchy and all the metadata needed, such as road widths, road IDs, and the number of roads meeting at an intersection. We trim each road section by a calculated amount based on the angles at which the roads meet. This creates enough room for the road intersection. Each road section is filled with the correct number of road modules, for each road width, we have three available modules, a 20 meter, a 10 meter, and a five meter module, allowing the entire road geometry to be mainly comprised of nine basic modules. Because the road sections can be any length, some space for scaling on the smallest five meter module was incorporated. For the intersections, we fill up the leftover room with road modules scaled to the appropriate length. Setting their pivot at the center of the intersection ensures they scale outward towards the road sections. Once calculated and assembled, the road modules are replaced by their high resolution counterpart. This image represents the geometry as it would appear in Unreal. The road processor would then output a point cloud that is instanced inside Unreal using our real processor pipeline. The road module has two sets of UVs and a relative vertex position is stored using vertex colors for maximum control inside the road materials. The road materials have a tapered skirt on the sides to ensure a smooth continuous connection with other road modules. A composite camber was added to the road modules to add further realism to the city roads. Once the road network and modules are placed, we extract the traffic information. Using the road metadata, splines are traced for each road lane and the intersection traversal to create the traffic grid. This network of splines contains all the information for the traffic and is imported into Unreal via a point cloud so that it can be interpreted into a zone graph by the traffic tools. The traffic system is covered in more detail by Julien Massand in his presentation section, bringing life to the city in the full Generating a World talk on the Unreal YouTube channel. The next step is the freeway generation. 
for the city's freeway, we knew that the chase sequence would happen at least on part of it. This had an influence on the complex organic look. We are trying to create parallax and depth. Quick iteration was required by the designers to edit the freeway layout for the chase sequence. A Houdini digital asset was used in Unreal with an input curve to generate simple freeway geometry, allowing designers to create a good sequence for the chase. This allowed a lot of iteration between the designers and the procedural team. This secured the freeway's look and level of interactive, interactivity um, required for the demo early in the project. Once the layout was locked, the splines were transferred back to Adini and used in the city graph. The cinematic department focused mainly on the big interchange. The rest of the freeway was, was built procedurally, composed of two closed loops, stacked overpasses, 55 access ramps, all contained in 25 kilometers of drivable freeway. A module instancing approach alone did not give the desired organic look. So unique geometry was procedurally created in a mega mesh. These custom meshes were generated to fit a specific area and then cut into 100 meter chunks for lumen and open world streaming performance. All of the set dressing pieces, such as the barriers, pillars, signs, and debris are nanite instances scattered along the freeway path. Like the road processing tool, the freeway tool would output point clouds for instancing in Unreal and provide metadata for the rest of the city graph. The freeway tool also generated the freeway deck meshes and its collision geometry. After the road and freeway data is output, the building lots and volumes can be generated. The lots start from basic definitions and height information provided by the initial cityscaping from the city layout tool. We cut the freeway layout away from the lot shapes. Next, careful geometry cleaning and filtering is used to allow for clean lot subdivision. The lot subdivision uses an algorithm that compares intended building height to the available lot surface area. The larger the area, the bigger the lot subdivisions can be but only if these lots are for tall buildings. The lots with the lowest building heights are divided into New York style lots with staggered terraced subdivisions. Once the subdivision is complete, you can see in red all the lots that have been filtered as not suitable for rectangular style buildings due to the lot shape. To avoid large quantities of unique building volumes being generated, we introduced a procedural building volume system. In the building DNA system, each building volume in a city can be described by a custom set of attributes. It's basic DNA, basically. The DNA starts with the footprint type. We have 17 in total. All the building volumes in the city would have one of these shapes as a base footprint. With this approach, we knew what to expect before generating the final buildings. Once the footprint is established, more attributes complete the DNA. The size in X and Y, its position and orientation in space, and the heights of three extrusion layers. The extrusion provides an extra bit of variation, mostly for taller structures, also the possibility for any building to be cubified or have staggered roofs, similar to the Empire State Building. The last round of the building DNA is the building style assigned to the volume. This technique allows a large variation of building silhouettes, ensuring every one of them is relatively unique while maintaining a very simple description to replicate the building volume. The lot subdivisions have one of the building footprints assigned. It works in two stages. Firstly, we adjust the percentage of a given footprint we would like to see in the city. Secondly, we ensure that each footprint is suitable to quantize tightly with the given building style. It's important because each building style has different module sizes, which limit its minimum footprint size for building generation. A minimum facade length safeguard is used to ensure that building generator will be able to fit the building style to the footprint area.
Finally, the building volumes are derived from the DNA footprints. The next step is to generate the buildings procedurally using shape grammar. Here, the building generator has been used in Unreal to add an extra building. To add an extra building to the small city level. Okay, the uh, movie does not seem to want to play. Okay. Okay, I'll have to skip that, unfortunately. Maybe not. Okay, so, so here I'm, I'm placing a building in a small city sample level. Um, no, I'm not. Okay, I'm going to skip that, sorry. JSON was chosen for the format of the building definitional files while prototyping um, we, we built an automated BDF pipeline uh, for this in time for when production went into full uh, swing. This gave us human readable data that could be edited quickly to validate and debug with. As we entered production, we had a good idea of how the city graph would drive the building generation. Data fed to the building generator consisted of building volumes with assigned BDF tags per primitive face. Here we can see each color represents a different building style. This is how the data flows inside the building generator in order of operation till final output. Output was in the form of point clouds and roof geometry passed into the city graph or directly into Unreal using Houdini Engine. Input volumes had to be cleaned carefully to give the best chance for cleanly sliced floor primitives to be generated in a consistent and ordered manner. The assigned BDF tag allowed the floor intervals to be calculated from the BDF's level dictionary and the volume is sliced accordingly. Once we have the floor sizes, corner types are calculated using the dot product between the primitives and walking around the uh, primitives in order of the IDs in ascending order. Shorthand monomics are used in the module dictionaries of each PDF for different corner types. Split corners are recognized using a, a collinear tolerance to distinguish if adjacent floor primitives should be considered in line. Five degrees was the tolerance we used on the project. If corner caps were defined in the PDF, they would be used instead of a split corner type and a predefined transform an offset was used for corner caps to allow the reuse of external corner assets as a corner cap. A building shape grammar system was needed to make the building generation as agnostic as possible. We wanted to avoid hard-coded behaviors that would constantly need to be reworked and debugged. This was the final shape grammar scheme. The vertical bars represent a module bucket. The buckets are used to define module placement behaviors. The alphabetic characters represent the dictionary key to look up the module metadata, like width, height, and whether a building module had a window. Circular brackets were used to define an infinitely repeatable macro, of, pat, mac, macro pattern of modules. <clears throat> Square brackets were used to define a fixed number of repeats for a macro pattern. The asterisk donates that all modules in that bucket can be scaled to fit the shape grammar to the length of the facade. Selecting the most appropriate grammar for a facade is driven by the total length of one full iteration of the shape grammar. The shape grammar with the smallest fit gap, not greater or equal to the facade length is selected. And here we can see how different grammars are used on a, as the length of the facade increases. On the left, you can see we have no entrances on that front facing facade. In the middle, we start to have one group of entrances. And then on the right, we have two groups of entrances. With the most suitable shape grammar selected, the modules are placed on the facade. Here we see the module placement and scaling according to the grammar being used as a facade increases in length.
The buildings are generated independently of neighboring buildings from each lot. This gives better parallelization for the graph execution. Occluded modules on connected building walls needed to be removed for memory and generation performance. In the city graph, each lot of building volumes are passed to the building generator as one job. This allows the height of neighboring building walls relative to the current building to be calculated using a Boolean operation. This Boolean result allows placed building modules to be tested against the shell with an intersection test. Only fully occluded modules that touch the intersection shell are flagged for removal. The occlusion had to be conservative as re-adding modules to cover holes is complicated when you consider recreating primitive data for, for windows, for example. Even with this conservative approach, a 25% reduction in building modules, props, and decals was achieved. This saved approximately a million instances across the whole city. The module occlusion is performed upstream of prop and window treatments in the building generator to save cycles on module instances that would be removed by the occlusion pass. The conservative approach is illustrated by the columns of corners still present in some of the NY, present in some of the New York style buildings. The place modules on the buildings have metadata to define functionality such as corner, wall, entrance. This metadata allowed the building generator to provide volumetric data back to the city graph to simulate exclusion of street furniture in front of building entrances. Building prop brandings were assigned per facade across the whole city with just a simple modulo seeding using the lot ID and building ID for determinism. However, if the city layout changed, the props can shuffle due to lot IDs and building IDs changing the butterfly effect. Being able to have the building generator run directly in Unreal using Houdini Engine allowed end users to play with prop densities and adjust seating. Controls were exposed on the UI for this purpose, allowing prop metadata to be tuned and then exported into BDFs. Volume overrides are supported in the building generator for the placement of fire escapes and brand overriding on props. Here we have the building generator running in Unreal using Houdini Engine. Uh, on this building, I want to place fire escapes on it interactively using the volume overrides. The volumes are given their override functionality by adding actor tag strings in Unreal. For example, the word fire escape is placed um, on the volume that is being used to place a fire escape. The override volumes are passed to the building generator using a tag volumes input on the UI. And finally, I want to change the prop branding using an actor tag for the desired brand. I want to extend the red coffee shop props to continue into the recessed area and there. For the windows, we generate primitive data for the window material to create believable rooms that span more than one window module. Building a connectivity array along each facade of modules can be, oh, we, we can then determine the maximum size of a room that can be placed. After placing a room, all modules in the room get a room ID and we move to the next module without, without an assigned room. A VEX, dic a VEX dictionary holds several seating arrays to select rooms based on the building function. The VEX SLH function made the bit packing of the primitive data easy. Window blinds and curtains are also placed with the same primitive data. Here in the movie, you can see lights being switched on per floor ID, then room ID. Okay, those are the room IDs. And now by increasing room size, and then finally, just iterating the blind selections. For window treatments, window helper objects 
were added to level one modules to define the, the modules, to define the window surfaces on a module. This data was stored as a prop anchor point for each building module. We needed a subsystem to populate window signage. We knew where each building entrance was and only placed signage close to entr entrances using the window helpers. The prop placement of Xcode with different filtering was reused to place the signage and window treatments. An internal VEX dictionary is used to encapsulate the placement rules and brand groupings for each of the differing building styles. Each window treatment and signage instance uses primitive data to drive the window sticker material in Unreal. All the roof geometry was derived from the input building volumes. UV generation scaling controls were added to deal with arbitrary roofs. The UV controls were exposed on the building generator UI for end users to evaluate good default values. Building volumes developed from simple cubes to complex cubified volumes and split roof support was added to deal with the complex volumes. Some window modules got sliced at the lower window edge, which is recessed back from the facade primitive, which left gaps. We created a function to analyze the floor slices at the split roof edges and apply a push or pull inset to hide these gaps. The building generator needed to be scalable due to the sheer amount of data it was generating. We achieved this using Houdini PDG. Almost 7,000 buildings with props, module occlusion, window treatments, window cube maps, ground decals, and roof geometry. This all generates in 30 minutes using PDG on a single X3990 Threadripper PC. Here are some data sets from the large city generation. We can see the fire escape module placement, building prop instances, the ground decals that give a connection between the buildings and the sidewalk and the window treatments all at the ground floor level. And here, window modules that had primitive data calculated for them. This is the graph of the building generator at the end of the project. Later in the project, we added a volume creator pass just before the building generator to create override volumes for the fire escapes, masking scheme used on a building style allowed us to populate the fire escapes in only on specific buildings. The volume creator also allowed for direct prop placement via primitive groups. An example of this is we do not want props or fire escapes placed in the New York style courtyards. The volume creator was also used to give the multi BDF volumes a stepped transition of the building styles. And also multi BDF style combinations were also tweaked following our direction concerns using the volume curator. Building optimizations laid in the project were also handled in the volume curator step. Memory was a concern, so the, the global height of the cityscape was reduced in certain height ranges, allowing a surgical strike without potentially causing a butterfly effect had this change been further upstream in the city graph. Our next step after the building generation is the city ground. The ground is, is under high scrutiny because this is where the player spends most of their time. Here we needed a very high fidelity in the assets and thus the need to use instancing elegantly. This, was, this uh, image represents our collection of sidewalk and floor modules. We didn't have displacement mapping in engine, so Nanite removes all the triangle limits and we ended up pre-displacing the floor tiles. Using modified mega scan surfaces with their displacement maps, each tile could have up to half a million triangles. This gives you a level of crispness and fidelity that we could never have achieved otherwise. As a city layout tool had provided us with a network of splines for the sidewalk and lot definitions, the sidewalk processor in the city graph uses these splines to scatter our sidewalk module collections in an adaptive manner, dividing each sidewalk section in a similar way to the road modules it would fit the correct number of tiles, solve the corners, and the ground coverage. Here we can see how the sidewalk processor works at different sidewalk connection angles. It calculates how many tiles are needed to make the sidewalk, randomly assigns types, and solves the external and internal corners independently. Notice on the inside corner, the red two triangle piece tile, how it scales non-uniformly to fit the space. 
For the ground, we subtract the building footprints first to save on the total area to be covered. Then the remainder is filled using an instance point cloud. The density, density of the instances reflect the size of the ground tiles placed. And this shows the same point of view inside the engine. And on the right, the different instances that compose the ground. Now that the ground is in place, we move on to the set dressing. First, we would harvest and filter all the areas that were left untouched, basically where there are no sidewalks or buildings. We created three biome definitions for the leftover zones. We have the plaza type, the freeway type, and the parking type. To populate these sub-biomes, we used our instance-packed blueprint workflow. These are pre-assembled collections of assets placed as a single instance. This workflow is described in more depth in a presentation from Botch Levi, Creating a World, again, on the Unreal YouTube channel. To distribute these biomes among the leftover areas, we used a scattering technique using the UV space of the zone. Using the UV layout node of Houdini, this is very efficient um, a very efficient way to scatter objects without worrying about objects intersecting each other. We developed our own version of the tool and called it the packing scatterer. It takes each independent zone, measures its longest edge and uses it as an orientation reference. It then performs a best fit for the biome elements with options to choose between different patterns and angles. We use this tool all over the graph to procedurally populate areas in an organized fashion. That also includes some of the rooftops for the buildings. Here is a fun example of what the packing scatterer can do to cover any type of area with organized patterns without any overlapping instances. And here the pattern and angle options have just been iterated on. Finally, the road decal placement it, in the ground covering uh, process. The traffic and parking lane data from the roads is passed to place different types of decals. For each calculated point, we spawn a simple plane that uses the decal material. Here, each marking that you see is an instance plane that is carefully placed at the exact ground level. This wireframe view gives a better idea of the instance geometry used for the road decals. For bigger chunks like the crosswalks or the tire marks, the plane would need more subdivision to adapt to the road's camber. In the situation of crosswalks, the camber on the road dictated that a mega mesh of unique geometry would need to be, would be needed to stop decals floating or intersecting the road surface. So the bigger planes are projected onto the road geometry to match its topology and then assembled in, into a mega mesh. Another challenge with the road decals was solving the complex traffic flow at intersections. A procedural graph analyzes the lane systems to create believable road markings and add further realism to the city roads. Okay, some stats, everyone likes stats. The most notable of these being how many times a city was regenerated during the project and the turnaround time for a full regeneration is pretty quick. And after every generation, we could scout the city and look for what could be improved in the procedural rules, fix bugs, add more details, and then regenerate the city in part or, full, or fully. Um, I'd like to just say a special thanks to um, the other procedural team members involved in the Matrix Awakens experience. Uh, it was a very special project, um, very, Learned a lot, it's very interesting. So if you're interested in procedural opportunity, opportunities at Epic Games, here are some details. Um, there's a link for internships on the website and you know, send an email to, to, uh, to Sarah um, with, with your details. We, we're always looking for very talented procedural artists um, to expand our core procedural teams. That was a brief overview. Um, please check out the full tech talks on the Unreal YouTube channel about the Matrix Awakens experience if you haven't already. I've had to skip a few subjects due to time. I didn't have time to talk about wave function collapse that we use to populate structures on the rooftops. I haven't covered the traffic or the pedestrians, the window cube map materials. They are covered in detail in these talks. 
Um, any questions? Okay, so I have a question from James. How did you create a smooth method for pulling the massive set of point cloud data generated in Houdini back into Unreal? So we, we built what we call the, the rules processor. So we were exporting an Alembic point cloud uh, from Houdini, and then we used the rule processor to uh, read that uh, and the associated metadata and different rules would populate the uh, metadata and break it down into different buildings, for example, um, uh, and we would be grouping uh, the different categories, sidewalks, roads, buildings um, directly in Unreal. Uh, that is the, the rule processor uh, pipeline is covered um, by Vochlevy in the creating, creating a world uh, talk on the, the uh, Unreal uh, YouTube channel. So question from Mike, uh, about the terrain height, is the whole city effectively built on a flat plane or is there uh, any uh, ground height? It is built on a flat plane. And the, the reason that we, we took that decision was um, because of the limitations we were, for memory and performance, um, by having roads um, and buildings kind of touching the ground at different levels, we would have increased uh, the module counts um, that we needed for each building um, significantly. And so, yeah, we we kept it flat to make our, our our lives a little bit easier on this project. So, any more questions? Um, so, question um, is, why, why were there no parks in the city? Is there a specific reason for omitting that kind of space? Um, that's a very good question. We originally wanted to do that. Um, we have some limitations with Nanite in terms of vegetation um, during the project. And we didn't find, once we built and composed the city, we didn't really find um, a useful space to have uh, the parks in. But yes, it's something we did talk about. Uh, we talked about other structures like parking structures and as you know, um, with projects, time can be a limiting factor and also resources. So at some point we, you know, parks uh, got cut and we were planning to use the WFC for the parks as well to, to populate um, pathways uh, and, and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you, it's a real pleasure to present. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, a, again, a fantastic talk. Uh, a lot of detail went into it, and I think that I would have easily, I would have easily uh, could go for, uh, listen for another half an hour, especially the wave function collapse. I'm already, now I'm, uh, now I'm curious how that was applied.